Hello all. Uh, after this short break, um, I'm happy that I um, can introduce Bart Pinders. Uh, Bart is an associate uh, professor in biomedicine and society at Maastricht University. He obtained his PhD from Maastricht University in 2008. And after this, he worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the Radboud University, Nijmegen till 2012 and as an Edmund J. Safra Network Fellow until 2014. His research focuses on scientific collaboration, mainly in fields such as biomedicine and nutrition science. He studies how scientists collaborate to create knowledge, how they render such knowledge credible, and how non-scientists are involved in knowledge production. Bart will talk today about the right tool for the job, replication as research norm. Bart, I'm happy I can give the floor to you. Okay, I hope that you can all hear me um, and uh, see my screen. Um, thank you very much for having me um, and true to our theme today, I get ready for a little repetition. Um, but before I begin, even though I was introduced, let me say a few additional words about myself. Uh, those words don't only serve as an introduction of me, uh, but also as a description of the lens, uh, perspective and a viewpoint uh, of this talk. Um, the right introduction can double as researcher positionality statements, which I, and I quote uh, Savin Baden and Major uh, here, um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, reflects the position that the researcher has chosen to adopt within a given research study. It influences how research is conducted, its questions and aims, as well as its outcomes and results. And transparency about researcher positionality is actually quite common in qualitative interpretive uh, research traditions, where I have found my home over the last years. But we're also increasingly seeing such statements in fields that traditionally have presented themselves as detached and objective, a testimony to the realization that science is not value free and that we need ways to deal with that. I was trained as a molecular biologist a long time ago, um, but I pursued an active parallel interest in the philosophy and sociology of science and in the public understanding of science. Early on, I decided that I would try out uh, chances for a career in science studies, which is the assemblage of the history, philosophy, sociology, and anthropology of science and technology. And so far it has largely worked out for me. Um, Today, I'm going to draw from that field in this talk on the conceptual boundaries of replication. And a key departure point worth mentioning um, is the constructivist perspective in science studies, the position that knowledge is made, not just discovered, and that studying the process of making knowledge teaches us valuable things about what science is, what it can be, and also where its limits are. Um, those of you um, who are diligently following this lecture series and have listened to the previous speaker uh, heard a lot about replication uh, vocabulary and the confusion that the coexistence of various definitions may create. When I speak about repli uh, replication, I am referring to the situation in which research is repeated by someone else using different data, equipment and staff but following original studies, methods, protocols, and processes. I'm not actually married to that terminology. Um, and the arguments of our previous speaker um, demonstrated uh, its value um, by simply by the demonstration of me having to explain this here. Um, there are, of course, certain degrees of freedom in such processes and where exactly boundaries between replication and quasi-replication lie are up for negotiation. And those negotiations are very, very valuable, of course, but I will not discuss them here. 
I would like to go back um, to the 1980s, actually the decade in which I was born, um, but also the decade in which um, the uh, sociologist of science, Harry Collins, wrote a book on replication. And to many sociologists and science studies scholars, it remains to be the book on replication. Um, almost two years ago, when I and many of my colleagues were reporting on research on replication at one of the big science studies conferences, multiple members of the audience commented that they did not understand what we were doing. The book had already been written and problems around replication were known. And we partially disagreed, of course. Um, Collins speaks about problems uh, with respect to credit for replications. Um, but what I want to focus on for the moment is his second argument on how communication in science and research works. Um, um, what Collins does is describe in detail how British scientists were unable to build a laser um, after receiving written instructions from the US, from colleagues. Um, this laser, a T laser. Um, and um, they received published papers, manuals, blueprints, data, much more. Um, and the problems weren't different conventions across the Atlantic or some careful scheme to prevent one group of researchers from attempting replication. Um, also, the original study was fine. The American laser worked. And the Americans were, in fact, helping the British to make their laser happen, providing all the information they could, answering every possible question to the best of their abilities. Um, and the only situation in which a replicated laser was made to work was when there were, was explicit personal contact between the original researchers and the researchers replicating the effort. And attempts to make it work via indirect exchanges all fail. Something in science, Collins argued, is transferred face to face through familiarity and proximity, which is not transferred through immensely detailed instructions, protocols, or data sets. And Collins refers to this as tacit knowledge. Uh, our ability to perform skills without being able to articulate how we do them. And the knowledge contributes to scientists' ability to complete experiments, this tacit knowledge, and studies successfully. But transferring it is highly problematic. How does one transfer what one cannot articulate? Um, in the current reform movements in science, open science and the increase of transparency uh, is pushed and it's increasingly seen as a way to transfer all that is required for a replication. Um, since the 80s and the time that Collins performed his analysis, our ability to transfer knowledge and transfer expertise and skill has actually greatly improved. Um, we now have entire infrastructures devoted to exchanging methods, exchanging protocols, instructions, data, code, and much more. Collins' tacit knowledge was, and still is, used as a large container term, assigning the same label to all elements that resist transfer. And the question that continues to be unanswered is to what extent open science practices and structures are clawing away at the boundaries of that container term. But despite the fierce critique, even Collins describes the value of replicability to, science as, to scientists as follows. Replicability is the supreme court of the scientific system. But Collins also qualifies that practice as more complex, less straightforward and inherently social. It matters who replicates a study what their relationship is to the original study and the researchers who performed that original study, where they work, and, for instance, their positionality. Over the last decade, and especially since the 80s, uh, replication has maneuvered itself into plain view. Well, it didn't do it by itself. The open science and reform movements have pushed hard for a different valuation regime in science in general and for replication in particular. And replication has benefited from this. 
um, replications have become more publishable, not as publishable um, as uh, the rest, um, but originality still stands firm. Um, replication has become more attainable because of open science, but huge portions of science are still not adhering to minimal standards for replicability. And significant fields of scholarship are rejecting or limiting uh, the value of replicability as a value or mark of quality within their epistemic communities. And of course, even if all the info for a replication is available, many replications still fail in the sense that they do not yield comparable outcomes. Um, how can we understand the changed position of replication in science and scholarship? And where do its conceptual boundaries lie? Is replication the right tool for the job? Um, for this question, I, uh, and for this lecture in general, in its title in particular, um, I draw from um, a book uh, called The Right Tools for the Job um, by Clark and Fuchimura. And the book is actually a collection of a whole score of empirical studies on how scientists develop tools and instruments um, in order to accomplish a certain task. And what we learn from the collection is that the connection between tool and job is one that has to be actively negotiated and maintained. And the rightness of the tool is contingent. It too is maintained, lost or refashioned. And the tool, its rightness and the job are all local in the sense that uh, one, two or all three can be different between labs, groups and more. If replication is the tool, what then is the job? Um, and when is some form of rightness achieved? And uh, Nosek and Erickton, Nosek was one of the speakers in uh, the previous uh, uh, webinar in this series. Uh, they write that the credibility of scientific claims is established with evidence for their replicability using new data. To them, the job is to establish and maintain the credibility of scientific claims and by extension that of scientists and science at large. Replication is the tool and it's accompanied by constitutive parts such as statistical rigor, pre-registration and many more. It is the right tool since within this epistemic culture, rightness is articulated using norms that demand stable access to nature, even if that nature is human nature. And we quickly encountered the problem of epistemic plurality of science here. Do we all concur that credibility of science is the job and that replication is the tool and that it is the right one? Let me focus on one particular boundary in this plurality of science. Um, there are endless epistemic boundaries in science, so some focus is a must. Um, and the boundary I'll choose is a, a coarse one, and the relationship between research and writing. Um, so in many sciences, writing takes the form of reporting. The scholarly text communicates findings obtained in research done elsewhere and mostly before. Research is in that way detached from writing. Sequencing a gene is an act separate from reporting it in writing, both physically and temporally. The analysis of the sequence data also exists separately. And again, the text reports on the task. On the opposite end, of this epistemic gradient are, um, for instance, some humanities and interpretive social sciences. They do not strictly separate research and writing, do not establish a clear boundary between the two. The text can, but does not have to be, a uh, report of research that exists elsewhere. Um, in some branches of philosophy, social theory, for instance, the text is the research. And the act of writing the text is identical to the act of doing the research. And even though some thoughts don't actually make it into the writing, the writing offers a bounded and coherent narrative in which knowledge making, not only knowledge made, 
is visible. And of course, there are many, many intermediate positions. In anthropology, for instance, notes and transcripts exist independent from the book, uh, observations do. Um, but the analysis of those notes, observations, do not exist outside of the text. They are inside of the text. And discussions of art and literature similarly acquire meaning in the context of the text. And when it comes to putting the world into words, um, those are quite distinct approaches. Um, and the first one maintains a network of so-called circulating references, connections between all the ingredients of a body of research, both material and textual, and that um, those circulating references extend far beyond the text into materials, into tools, into equipments, into genes or particles or whatever it is that you're studying and people and more. Um, and the latter culture of research also maintains networks of circulating references, yet those exist largely um, in the text and in other text. So why does that matter to us here and now? Well, if and when we think about replication as the right tool for the job, um, what we need and require to access the value, quality, uh, credibility of these types of networks and the claims that emerge from them is actually quite different. Um, on the one end, um, where, where references are contained largely to the text, assessing that text equals assessing the quality of the research and the integrity of the network of references. On the other end, um, where research is disconnected from the text, assessing that text doesn't tell us anything or at least not enough to assess the quality of the research since it offers almost no access to the network of circulating references that ties it to samples, materials and the objects that all the data points actually refer to. Um, so um, we can either just believe the authors or test the integrity of the network of circulating references beyond the test, uh, text. And that test um, is a repetition. And uh, repetition is a way to trace the connections between research underlying the text. If another team repeats the research, asks the same question, produces their own data, analyze it and report results that overlap sufficiently or perhaps even fully, um, only then have we truly assessed quality? Um, and can we assign credibility? Um, so in other words, safeguarding the quality and credibility of scientific and scholarly claims, the job requires different tools in different epistemic cultures. And replication is powerful, valuable, and quite possibly without an alternative to some, um, but largely unnecessary. To others. Um, and if we take Collins' metaphor of replication as the Supreme Court in the scientific system, its jurisdiction is not universal or global. Um, when we turn our gaze away from publication and towards other smaller, less extreme, um, or perhaps less visible epistemic boundaries, the tool, job, and rightness are still far from universal. While it may seem that we all agree on the job, safeguarding the credibility of science, scientists and scientific claims, even there, our ideas of what credibility is and should be differ. Um, when it is the right tool for the job, replication becomes a demonstration of and a commitment to accountability in science and a facilitator of knowledge making. Accordingly, it offers great rewards. However, it only does so when mobilized in the appropriate context and um, when its limits and constraints are respected. In some fields, those reveal themselves as very practical problems. Certain phenomena cannot be recreated to recollect data. Sometimes it's uh, outside of the ability of humanity. Recreating the Big Bang requires some divine intervention. Um, otherwise, 
or sometimes it's because phenomena are fleeting. Um, social interactions, communities, collectives, they emerge and disappear. A simple example, we cannot replicate any pre-COVID vaccine hesitancy study because the object does not exist anymore. Um, vaccine hesitancy pre-COVID and post-COVID are different things. Um, some fields strive not to describe nature or culture, but to interpret it and to offer multiple contrasting interpretations of one object of study. And here, uh, replication not only becomes powerless, but possibly superfluous. A replication can be a demonstration of and commitment to accountability in science and a facilitator of knowledge making, but in the wrong situation, it could be research waste. Based on the work of Sabina Leonelli, we initiated a taxonomy of replicability in which we seek to distinguish different tool job rightness conceptualizations. And after listening to the previous speaker, um, we need to think really hard about how to integrate uh, different conceptual um, images and representations of um, repetition. Um, but overall, the message is that to spend resources on replication is wise, but to spend those resources where they matter is even wiser. But that does not mean um, that those working in places where replication is less or not so in instrumentally valuable, that those researchers um, do not have to actively and reflectively engage with the trustworthiness of their work. If for whatever reason your work is not or does not have to be replicable, you are not excused from rigor, from honesty, from scrupulousness, or from the norms and values that prescribe responsible science in your um, field of work. But there are more ways to do that. There are more tools for the job. Um, philosopher of science, Stefan Göttinger, uh, for instance, describes how scientists use controls and in intra-experimental repetitions in the form of so-called micro-replications. Um, and by themselves, these micro-replications are fragmented, tiny, and they have very little explanatory power. But when taken together, and they become valuable, they become powerful as support for the credibility of scientific claims. And none of those micro replications live up to the definitions key reformers propose for replication, yet they still do the job. In reflexive qualitative research, data analysis and publication is heavily contextualized. Researcher positionality, I started with it, for instance, is an example of such, such contextualization, but there is a lot more. Again, no replication, not even an attempt towards replicability, but still high quality qualitative research seeks to be credible too, um, but seeks to do that differently, matching epistemic traditions it is conducted in matching the job, the tool, the right way. In that light, calls to separate transparency from replicability in multiple epistemic domains make perfect sense. Um, in their anthropological study of meta-science, uh, David Peterson and Aaron Panofsky described the open science replication and reform movements as scientific social movements under the label combined of meta-science. And as social movements, meta-science um, pushes a distinct agenda. It uses crisis narratives as means to achieve that agenda. In the process, uh, the credibility crisis in science and the replicability crisis in science have been actively connected to each other and perhaps merged um, into a single political project to improve science. That goal, the improvement of science, is in itself laudable. Few will object to that goal, the job in the vocabulary of this talk. 
in this generic form. However, uh, when it comes to molding scientific practice onto scientific ideals, removing the mismatch um, that um, meta science sort of amplified into a scandal, whether those ideas are actively and uniformly shared um, becomes a big question. And Peterson and Panofsky recognize a danger when the proposed reform or social movement becomes system wide. They write, if meta-science achieves its vision of becoming the diagnostician and therapist for science writ large, the sciences, which have involved in a thousand uh, independent histories buffeted by internal and external forces, are going to increasingly be treated as capital S singular science. And that last capital S is not a compliment, but rather the worry that those many histories and traditions optimized towards a specific form and object of inquiry are being erased. The worry that the careful crafting of job, tool and rightness is operationalized as the proverbial hammer and nail. The phrase, the scientific method that we all know um, and distrust suggests more uniformity than science can deliver and more than it should strive to deliver. The thousand independent histories Peterson and Panofsky speak about, um, in the words of philosopher Philip Kitcher, they become plural methods. These plural methods have plural histories, but share one label. Um, trusting science assigning its voice more credibility than other voices hinges on, as historian of science Oreskes stresses in her latest book, the social facets of various scientific communities. The process is designed to allow trustworthiness to be displayed alongside or as part of research. Um, to Kitcher and Oreskes, the ways in which scientists engage with the world, the evidence they seek and assign legitimacy to, the approaches and techniques on which grounds um, of them, uh, on which groups of them agree, and the ways that standards of evidence, skill, and expertise are collected in communities, including expectations of replicability, they form the basis of scientific credibility. Kitcher writes, there is no such thing as scientific method unless it is simply a vague collection of discordant ideas, utterly irrelevant to day-to-day -day practice of science. But there are scientific methods, products of a long history of inquiry. When considering the trustworthiness of science, those method methods are crucial. Those methods, those many methods, and those very different methods have parallel yet, yet different histories of establishing, negotiating, optimizing, and continuously updating the relationship between tool, job, and rightness. Trust in science is, despite um, our many contrasting and competing ideas of what it is and how it should be accomplished, the ultimate job. Accomplishing that job needs many tools and each needs to be uh, deployed in the right place in the right time. And replication is such a tool, um, but it is one of many such tools. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bart, um, for your interesting talk. Maybe um, I have a question about um, in relation uh, with a new initiative from NWO. NWO is one of the large research funding organizations in the Netherlands. And they recently conducted a number of pilots in which they stimulate replication studies. And uh, my question, uh, related to uh, one of your statements in your talk is um, should MWO be wise 
uh, and exclude some academic fields from such goals? Um, well, that's a good question. I actually think that in nearly all um, of the fields and disciplines that we have in academia, so in the sciences, in the social sciences, and also in the humanities, um, there are types of scientific and scholarly claims being made that ought to be replicable. Um, but there are also, um, sometimes in, this, in the same fields and disciplines, um, claims generated that do not necessarily have to be replicable. Um, and um, that may sound weird if you're a physicist, where that sort of is an, a generally shared norm. But if you're in the humanities, then um, great examples are, for instance, if you want to establish, um, well, we already saw examples in, in the previous uh, presentation, but if you want to establish, for instance, whether or not a certain painting needs to be attributed to a certain painter, or a text needs to be attributed to a certain author. Um, it would be great if those types of claims were replicable, um, if agreement uh, can be reached on them. Um, but if you're talking about the interpretation of um, literary sources, of movies, of plays, um, of art in general, um, then those interpretations do not necessarily have to be replicable. Um, and it's not even the goal of the production of that interpretation for it to be replicable. It's not produced with replicability in mind. Um, that does not mean that you can just say whatever the hell you like. Um, mm -hmm. There is still this demand on rigor. There is still a demand on transparency. There is still a demand on displaying in great detail how you got to the results that you have collected and how you interpret them. This act of transparency is perhaps even more important if it is not possible um, to trace or retrace or repeat the entire trajectory of knowledge making. Um, so when um, there is a stimulation, uh, financial stimulus, to uh, support replication, um, I fully support that. Um, and I think that there is in each knowledge domain relevant work uh, that can benefit from replication as well as from support of that re replication, but it should not extend to every knowledge claim, um, but you can extend it into every domain. Yeah, thank you. Maybe then uh, related to this, also a uh, follow-up question. Um, and that's also a little bit related um, to, the, to the first question. Um, that if it's officially accepted by NWO and the research funder, that specific areas of research cannot be reproduced can this have consequences for the public perception of these fields? So could this have the effect that such fields will eventually be viewed by public uh, as less serious or less reliable? Um, well, there's always been um, a differentiated um, trust in science. Um, so trust in science at large doesn't extend the same way to every field, every discipline, every institute um, and every individual researcher. Um, but um, I think that it is um, quite important um, for funders, um, science communicators, scientists themselves, um, but also journalists, etc., to display the plurality of science, um, to show that what all researchers in science and the humanities share is a commitment to rigor, um, but that this looks differently in different places, um, and that the standards you would hold an engineer to, um, to demonstrate that the bridge he constructed will not fall down with the first car that drives over it, um, that that is not the same standard you can apply 
to a chemist um, or to a literary researcher or to a sociologist, um, but that all have standards and all should be held to those standards. Um. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think because of the sake of time uh, and also and that we always need to also take care of ourselves, uh, that we uh, take a five minutes break, then we are back at uh, 16.35, and then we continue with our last speaker of today, Peter van Haar. So, but first, uh, for everybody, a small break. And again, uh, thank you, Bart, for your talk, and we continue in five minutes. <laughs> 